Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. All right, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Today I have Riley Poe, who is a PharmD candidate for May 2018 from Drake University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Des Moines, Iowa. He's pursuing PGY-1 pharmacy practice residencies with career interests in critical care, infectious disease, and emergency medicine. In his free time, he loves to travel to foreign countries, explore the outdoors, and try local restaurants. So Riley, welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Tony, thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast. I'm excited to be here with you and everyone as they're listening today as a guest. Great. I'm, I'm really excited to have another Drake student on. We just had Michelle Magas on, who is uh, phenomenal, uh, did some international travel. You did some as well. Uh, but you also have some unique interests that I kind of wanted to delve into. Uh, but first, before we get there, um, everyone's leadership road is a little different. Tell me a little bit about yours and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I think my leadership started before I even came to Drake. My roots are in sports. I was huge into sports growing up. So I think my leadership and being part of a team started with sports. I was never the most athletically gifted person on the team, but I was the one who hustled and put in 110% effort. So I think around that, my teammates began to notice that and respect that. So my leadership kind of grew from that lead by example type and be able to get everyone in the camaraderie of the team to work together. And then once I got to pharmacy school, it kind of took me a little while to find my footing in leadership and find where I could fit in in a side of pharmacy and inside of school outside of sports. I was no longer an athlete once I got to Drake. And so I never had an official role in any big organization on campus. I wasn't the president of APHA or the secretary of ASHP or anything like that. But I found ways to get involved in leadership through my jobs down at Mercy in downtown Des Moines or to get involved in different projects going around campus. And then I got involved with Adams Academy at Drake, which is a leadership institute that's run by the university where students from all the colleges get together and they have guest speakers come in and talk about leadership opportunities. And through that, I was able to go out to the Lincoln Leadership Institute in Gettysburg, which is run by Stephen B. Wiley. And it's a big leadership institute that a lot of Fortune 500 companies bring their employees to. Apple's been there. Pfizer's been there. Just kind of to name drop a couple of the big names that train there at this leadership institute. And those kind of really opened my eyes into different ways that we as leaders can impact the people that we're leading. And through that, I came back to campus and I um, took on the student representative role of Central Iowa Pharmacists Association. So I was essentially the student president responsible for getting all members involved, um, getting students involved in that community organization. So for me, it's kind of been a journey that keeps evolving and I'm continuing to learn different leadership strategies and learn from leaders and learn from role models as I continue to go on as a leader in my professional journey. So tell me a little bit about traveling to the, uh, is it the Stephen B. Wiley and Lincoln Leadership Institute at Gettysburg? I think uh, the out-of-state experiences tend to be uh, really impactful. Uh, certainly people are going to APHA for Nashville and that's more traditional, but tell me a little bit about that. I've, I've never heard about it. Gettysburg was just a couple hours from uh, Baltimore where I lived. So what what do you do there? How does you know the war or the leadership during the war kind of feed into the actual leadership experience? Yeah, so I'd say this is one of the top experiences I had as a student at Drake through Adams Academy. I was in the first group of students that got to go, and there's about 20 of us students that had graduated Adams Academy. We drove a bus out to Gettysburg, and it was 18, 20-hour bus ride out there with everyone. So um, we got we got there, and Stephen B. Wiley and his team, uh, there's PhDs on his team. There's people who have war experience, uh, veterans, um, and a lot of different diverse people who are historians and really scholars of the bat- gap Battle of Gettysburg um, in the Civil War. So they use those incidents of the Battles of Gettysburg to explore different leadership concepts and kind of leadership strategies that they'd like to impart onto the people that come and 
take part in the Institute. So they talk about positioning for strategic advantage. So being able to do things in advance to put yourself in a position where you can be successful. How do you engage your followers? How do you keep them excited? How do you keep them wanting to come to work and, you know, reach the company's goals or the mission or take care of patients in a way that embodies the hospital's vision? Or how do you manage conflict or professional disagreement? And how can you go about that in a tactical way to keep that team and camaraderie together. So all in all, just they use the battle as a way to kind of shape how leadership is and kind of show from a historical view how a lot of the leadership concepts haven't changed in 200 years. And those kind of things are the same, but the way we implement them into our teams and our businesses or our hospitals is changing and helping us become better leaders in that way. They used, uh, we walked the battlefields of Gettysburg and that was kind of our experience there and really a different learning experience for how you can be a leader. Yeah. So Sun Tzu, I think was a general that said every battle is won and lost before it's ever fought. And you'll go into a pharmacy and I guess it's maybe even disappointing sometimes that the pharmacy is so quiet that you it's running so well there there just aren't problems because everything was kind of set up ahead of time but tell me how you brought that back to the Central Iowa Pharmacists Association because you know you mentioned you're not president of APHA but you are in contact with uh, pharmaceutical representatives you're in contact with the local pharmacists uh, so tell me a little bit about that leadership yeah so as, as student representative um, it's a relatively underutilized and underknown um, pharmacist association from the student level. So we usually have about 10 to 15 students that are participating in this. So when I took over as student representative, it was my job kind of to increase um, awareness on campus. So to be able to get more members and get people out into the community. Most of the pharmacists that are a part of this are from Mercy downtown, so working as clinical pharmacists down at the hospital. And then we bring in um, speakers, whether they're for CEs or for new drug presentations or pharmaceutical-sponsored events to uh, teach students about new drugs, teach pharmacists about new drugs, new disease states. Um, We let the residents from Mercy and Methodist give CE presentations so pharmacists can both earn CE and students are able to be there and learn something. So I think it's beneficial for everyone involved. It's good networking for student pharmacists that want to work on the inpatient side. They get to meet um, people who work on the inpatient side and talk to them about their experiences and get advice that way. So being able to be the lead of that and get people involved, I think was something that I benefited from the leadership experience I had prior to taking that role. So tell me a little bit about your, uh, publication that you had in the APHA student pharmacist uh, uh, publication that they have. It was about capitalizing on your rotation. So you've gone and kind of had these out-of-state experiences. You've brought that back and you've assumed a leadership role within the community. But now you're telling other people uh, and kind of leading them through your words and and your experience. How do you uh, get a publication out there? I know many people applying for residencies like, well, how do I get a publication? I'm just a student. Uh, What do I have to offer? So how did you put that together? Because that's a national publication. Yeah, so the the publication kind of stemmed right after my P3 year. I met with a faculty member at Drake to review my CV and kind of look for things that I could add to it. How could I diversify it? How could I make myself stand out? And having a publication was something that we thought would be an awesome experience from a student perspective, but also make me stand out as a residency candidate going forward. So I started to brainstorm some ideas. I contacted the APHA student magazine editor and said, hey, I'm looking to get involved in writing an article and through some dialogue with him and figuring out what topics he thought would be beneficial, what topics I thought I could write about. We came to um, basically navigating the competitive residency world and how we can capitalize on your rotation. So the article is entitled Capitalize on Your Rotations. And it goes through from a student perspective as a P4 back in September, um, kind of the thoughts that were going through my head and how I thought I could kind of disseminate that information to my peers as we're all going through this competitive residency process and what things you can do. You know, you can reach out to your mentors, get some advice. You can have them 
um, set up your letters of recommendation. You can make sure that you're learning everything you can day in and day out at your site, whether that's going above and beyond and watching a procedure or learning something new or taking on those opportunities. So it's really about how you can step outside your comfort zone and take on opportunities as you're going through your APPEs to make yourself stand out and be a better candidate as you apply for residencies, which we know are, you know, very competitive now. Um, you're kind of fortunate at Drake. People tend to get their first or second. No, they tend to get their first choice, actually, most of the time in terms of uh, where they're going to go. But I was talking to residency directors at ASHP, um, and the one thing that I, I kept hearing over and over again is that uh, there's this expectation that residency directors have time to read carefully through every little bit of your uh, CV, and that's not usually the case. I took a glance at your CV and immediately I was like, oh, this is a this is a hospital resident CV. Um, so tell me a little bit about the APPEs and how you set yours up so that when I look at it, it looks like I'm like, this guy's going to do a hospital residency, I can tell uh, from the from the rotations. Can you tell me first how you set up the which res, which APPEs you're going to do? And then if you had any opportunity, what order you would recommend putting them in if you're trying to be an inpatient hospital resident? Yeah, so that's a good question. I know the P3 schedules just came out, so I know all the students are excited about that and looking forward to that. For me, I set them up in a way to have diverse learning experiences. When I was a P3 student um, in December, when we submitted those into the experiential office, I wasn't 100% set on hospital residency. So I wanted to make sure that my experiences were diverse in a way. I started out at a specialty care um, outpatient pharmacy that focused on rheumatologic meds. And it's a unique way. And they only have seven, seven or eight employees that work there. Um, so I got that unique experience of a small business feel and specialty pharmacy, which is up and coming right now. A lot of people want to get into specialty pharmacy. And then I had two rotations in acute care that allowed me to partner with the internal medicine team and be the pharmacy representative on that team. So I got that good, strong inpatient experience, but also the experience of working on a medicine team and being able to communicate with the residents, medical students, and the attending to make those interventions that we needed. And then I went to an outpatient setting endocrinology clinic up in Minnesota, where pharmacy is, is really driving change. Minnesota is one of those places where pharmacists have a lot of autonomy. And in the practice I was at, the pharmacist that I worked with was working directly with an endocrinologist in that office to make medication changes through medication therapy management. Worked a lot through collaborative practice to make those changes and order labs or increase insulin or start new medications or stop medications that she didn't think were effective. So there's a lot of autonomy in that way. So it was an awesome learning experience to be able to learn firsthand and have those interactions with patients, but also be able to practice at the top of our license and make those adjustments that we felt were clinically necessary. Next, I went down to Sarasota, Florida. So I got to, um, you know, escape the Iowa winter, escape the Wisconsin <laughs> winter, go down to Florida uh, for three months total. The first was hospital practice um, down at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. It's a big um, teaching hospital, level one trauma center down in Sarasota where the population is growing like gangbusters down there. And it was, I was in season when everyone from up North comes down to Florida. So the hospital was constantly at capacity. Census was always high. So it was a good experience there to have in hospital practice where I could go around and see different areas of the hospital and how that worked is a good overview of a big institution and how all the moving parts kind of come together to take care of patients uh, my most recent rotation was d down there as well. I did 10 weeks uh, down at Sarasota Memorial, and that was in critical care, which was an awesome experience for me. I chose critical care because I knew it would be a challenge. It's not something we get a lot of experience with as students, and our patients are more acutely ill than we see anywhere else. They're not internal medicine patients. They have chronic conditions compiled by acute conditions, and everything is kind of adding up in a negative way. For those patients, they're constantly changing. Labs are changing four times a day. You know, patients are going up and down, up and down. So there's a lot of stuff that as pharmacy students we can learn and a lot of interventions that I found on critical care. Then next, I'll be going to 
a community setting and outpatient hospital setting. So I'll get to deal with that transition of care, which is increasingly important to try to keep our patients from being readmitted to hospitals. And then last, I will be back in Des Moines at an internal medicine clinic with a faculty. So I'm excited for my next two rotations and, you know, kind of getting excited for residency. graduation. <laughs> graduation. Yeah. You know, graduation is, you know, 80 some days away. So I'm getting excited for that. And then as far as setting up and any advice I could give for um, recommending your order, I think it is important to have those experiences that you'd like. If you want to go to a residency, it's important to have those inpatient experiences up front. And a lot of people say that just so that you you have those experiences. So if you like it, you know you like it. If you don't like it, you figure out you don't like it and you still have time to change and maybe go into specialty pharmacy or community residency or community pharmacy or industry. You have that flexibility to figure out what you like. And that's kind of what your rotations are for is to figure out what you like. But I would recommend your if you can get your harder rotations up front, that kind of stands out and gives you something to talk about when you go to residency interviews because you've had those experiences on the inpatient side, which are extremely important for showing that you've that you've had that experience, you've worked with medicine teams, you've made interventions on the inpatient side. So I think if you can structure your rotations in any way to your advantage, that would be, would be what I recommend. So tell me a little bit about coming to the critical care uh, residency. You you were in, I guess, block five or block six, block f- somewhere somewhere around there. And there's you don't want it too early that you're just starting, but you were kind of at the point where you had been done almost half of your rotations. Uh, what does it feel like when you come into a critical care one, which is one of the you know obviously most uh, difficult ones or most challenging ones? Um, how how well prepared did you feel for that? Did you feel uh, pretty comfortable? And you did a, a double there with the two back to back, so you're already familiar with like EHR and things like that. Um, how well prepared did you feel for that uh, APPE? Yeah, the having ten weeks there, I th- I think was extremely important because I could use that first five weeks to explore the EHR, know where to find different things, and get to know people and, and that kind of stuff. So when I got to critical care, I was able to hit the ground running on that front. But clinically, it's it's very, the learning curve is it was very steep. There's a lot of things that you never see, drugs you don't see, drips you don't see when you work on the internal medicine side or not on critical patients. So that learning curve was steep for me. I, ha- I had an awesome preceptor at that experience that basically was a stepwise approach. So for the first week, I was shadowing and she took me in the room and showed me how the vent worked and the pumps and the PCAs and things like that just on the first week as just a baseline of critical care and what we look for and how we monitor those patients. And we went through each consult and how we work up those consults on our patients. And we have Banco consults and Warfarin consults and Propofol consults. So going through each one of those individually and teaching me how to do it and what things I need to look for and monitor on these patients was extremely important. And then as we built up, I was able to, by week five, I was working up eight patients and doing all the consults for those eight patients by the time I was done there. So I had my entire unit to myself. I rounded by myself and made interventions with the intensivist in that way. So I think having that stepwise approach and building from week to week was important. I am not a critical care pharmacist from that five weeks, but I definitely have exposure and I've felt that that exposure has helped me through uh, residency interviews, having a strong critical care experience and having that experience dealing with those critical patients was important. And though the learning curve was tough at first, I do think I learned a lot of stuff. And since I did that critical care rotation, I think it's an advantage for me. Some residency applicants are absolutely terrified about the case so that, you know, you're going to get asked a certain case and uh, you're going to be asked to solve that case. Uh, How did you feel you did with that particular question or what was it that best prepared you for uh, the scenario or case uh, questions that came from uh, the the residents or the interviewers there? Most of the cases I had, and I will say um, some places didn't have a case, some cases do, some places have a written case or a soap note. Some places kind of just intertwined clinical questions throughout the interview. So it totally depends 
where you interview, but I didn't have anyone ask me any specific critical care questions. I didn't have them ask, you know, we have this patient who's sedated on 80 mics of propofol. How, what's your plan to decrease that into a safe range or how are we going to adjust the PCA? So no questions were critically care focused, but I do think having that experience helped me out. So preparing for the um, clinical cases, I think is something that, yeah, it does. It scared me when I, I didn't know what, what to expect, but I think if you focus on common disease states and things that you've learned over and over in those more internal medicine, general acute care topics, and when you're interviewing for an inpatient residency are the things they're going to focus on. They're going to try to challenge you. They're going to ask you things that you maybe know something about, but don't know a lot about to test your critical thinking skills and see how you think on the fly, because many times they're not asking to know if you know the exact right answer, but they want to see if you can process the information, if you know what labs you need to look at or what patient characteristics you should look at to make that decision. So they're looking more at the clinical thinking process and how you actually think than whether you get to the exact right answer at that time. They know it's a learning experience and you're still only a student and residency is to help build those skills. So that's more what they're looking for in that case. So I didn't have anyone that asked me specifically a critical care case. Okay. But having the critical care experience, I was able to speak to when they asked, what's the most challenging rotation you've had? And I had a good story to say I came in not knowing much about critical care. And by the end, I was able to take care of and manage eight patients, work them up, round on them, and also complete the consults for them. So I think in that is a good learning experience for me. Okay. And even that number, I don't know if that's a big number or a small number, but it sounds like if you're in critical care, that would actually be a lot. Yeah. So my, my preceptor would manage like 24 patients. So Whoa. I was about a third, a, third, <laughs> okay. a third of what she had okay. by the end. All right. And so, you know, you, you've done the rotations, you're, you're on your way. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, how you approached ASHP for those that are going to be um, hitting ASHP next year or what, what your process is going into kind of deciding which residencies because there are hundreds of them. Uh, how did you, you know, kind of uh, what's your thought process with um, going into uh, where do I go to look for residencies and things like that? What advice could you give? Yeah, I, th I think first you have to kind of sit down and think about your career goals is the first thing that you need to do. You need to make sure that you want a residency because sometimes residency is just one of those things you think you should do after, but it doesn't really match your career goals. It's not really what you want to do. So once you've established that residency is what you want to do, you have to decide whether you want a community residency, an AMCARE residency, an inpatient residency. So going through that, and then ASHP has a awesome website platform that can take you through the different kind of residencies and break it up by state. So if you're geographically located, you can look at the PGY1 pharmacy practice residencies in the state of Wisconsin or the state of Iowa or California wherever you may want to go. And then from there, each residency is going to be different in the core rotations they have, the uh, elective rotations they have. It's all, it's all going to be different in that way. You know, you're going to have some hospitals that are academic medical centers and they have, you know, hundreds of beds there. You're going to have places that are smaller that have a hundred beds. Some places have two residents, some places have 16. So there's a lot of things to kind of consider. And it all goes back to, your career goals and how you can find a residency that matches those career goals is the most important thing somewhere that's going to allow you to learn at the best of your ability and allow you to practice the way you want to practice pharmacy. For me, it was a lot of, um, I guess it started out figuring out what I wanted and figuring out programs that met that, but then also narrowing it down to a geographic area. It's hard to look at programs in California and then look at programs in Florida or look at programs in New York. And, you know, there's becomes too many programs. And like you said, you know, there's hundreds and or thousands of programs out there, residency spots. So being able to have a focus either on a specific type of program that you're willing to go anywhere for or focusing more on a geographic area that has programs that are going to help you meet your needs and then as far as preparing for mid-year, I think once you have that list of programs, it's important to prepare and know something about the program so you know what you want to ask them when you go to the booth. Um, it's, a busy, it's busy there, and 
if you don't know what you want to ask, sometimes someone gets in front of you and asks the question. So knowing what you want from a program and what you want to know from them there, it's all about the prospective residents in that. And they do a lot to present their program and help you learn more about it so that when it time comes time to submit your application, you know if you want to submit it there or don't want to submit it to that place. Sounds good. Well, I've asked you a bunch of questions. Uh, are there any things that you wanted to uh, talk about or uh, any advice you want to give that I haven't asked you about? I think so. So I don't, I don't have a lot of advice to give. So probably some advice that I've received that I could pass on um, is a Vincent Van Gogh quote, oddly enough, but it says, normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk, but no flowers grow on it. So for me, that kind of means that everything that is on a paved road has already been done, and that's the path that someone else took to get there. But nothing is growing. You're not growing yourself. You're not growing your skills if you just walk down that road that someone else has already paved. So there's no one way to reach a goal. And if you took 10 pharmacists that are practicing in the area that you want to practice in, all 10 of them probably have different experiences and different paths that led them to that position. So if I could impart advice that people have imparted on me throughout my journey is that go off that paved path and step outside your comfort zone, get yourself unique experiences that make you different from the person next to you. And all those experiences will build up and help you be successful in whatever career path you choose. Well, Riley, thanks so much for being on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everyone for listening. Support for this episode comes from Goodnight Pharmacology, 350 brand and generic name drugs with classifications, a leading resource for students in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. Print, ebook, and audiobook available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag HashPharmacyLeaders 